two, one, and welcome to the Evaluative Clinical Sciences Rounds. Uh, uh, Natalie Coburn is away, um, uh, although she may join us at the end, so you're stuck with the understudy uh, uh, on me. I'm Don Redelmeyer, and I've got my usual four points. Number one, please mute your microphone, and uh, although we do encourage you to keep your video feed allowed. Number two, please use the group chat function at the end uh, to raise questions. You don't have to type out your entire question. All you have to do is say, I've got a question, I'll then call upon you. Uh, 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 number three, please be gentle on the presenter. When in doubt, give the presenter the benefit of the doubt. He doesn't mean to be rude. He is just trying to be funny. Number three, uh, uh, number four, and finally, please be gentle on me when I mangle your name. Again, it is not a sign of disrespect. It is only a reflection of incompetence. All right. Who is our presenter today? Dr. Larry Robinson, who received his bachelor's degree in chemistry from Brandeis University and an MD degree in medicine uh, from, from Baylor, and then is followed by internship and residency in a combination of physical medicine and rehabilitation, uh, uh, mostly inside uh, uh, Northwestern University in Chicago. The glory days where one could get a faculty position without a PhD in anything. Uh, Dr. Robinson is currently the program chief for rehabilitation uh, uh, medicine at Sunnybrook. He's a full professor at the University of Toronto, a senior scientist inside Sunnybrook. He is the citywide DDD for physical medicine and rehabilitation sciences, as well as the Eaton Chair in the rehab sciences. That is a lot of prestige, a lot of power. Um, lots and lots of accomplishments uh, to match all of those years including multiple prizes for mentorship and research for leadership. He's got over 86 Medline articles of which he's first author on 16, and including some really interesting novel ideas about laryngeal electromyography, published about two years ago. He's the co-investigator on, on numerous active grants, and he knows more about speaking Canadian than the average Canadian. Thanks very much for being with us, Larry. Uh, thank you. Thank you for inviting me. Thank you for that very interesting, very uh, great introduction. I was going to say interesting, but I know that Canadian interesting means a different thing than it does in America. So please do be gentle on me because I do come from the States. So I'm going to be talking about uh, peripheral nerve injuries. I think uh, Don covered most of my uh, history. I'm not the hockey player. So if you came thinking that you would see the Habs defenseman, you will be disappointed. I am originally American. And when I was in Seattle, I was the chair of rehab medicine and vice dean of PGME. Came to Sunnybrook in 2014. Actually got my full citizenship in 2019. And as Don mentioned, I uh, have several positions at U of T and St. John's. And currently I'm the president of the Canadian Association of PMNR. Uh, my fun fact, which I'm often asked to present, is that I am addicted to cycling and I'm often on the way to work and I will see Dr. Raylemeyer at the red light waiting to cross and we get a chance to chat then. Uh, so, which is uh, what, always a fun thing to have happen. Uh, I don't really have any financial disclosures, but as I said, I am originally American. I am not Republican, I will just say that right up front. So don't get too concerned about that. So today, what I'd like to cover is to discuss the epidemiology and classification of nerve injuries, which we see a fair amount of here at Sunnybrook, discuss how the electrodiagnostic methods allow for characterization and estimation of prognosis, and to start talking about some new surgical treatment options that are coming up on the horizon, and some of which are here in full force already. Uh, so just to give you a little sense of the frequency of peripheral nervous system trauma, uh, if you look at patients admitted to level one trauma centers, and in fact, this data was from Raj Midha a number of years ago. About two to three percent of all those admitted to a place like uh, Sunnybrook here or Harborview Medical Center, where I was in Seattle, have peripheral nerve injuries. Another two to three percent, roughly, have brachial plexus injuries. So about five percent of people coming in the door will have peripheral nerve injuries. Uh, if you have uh, people with traumatic brain injury, many of whom we'll see in rehab, 
a larger number of those because they have more severe, inju severe injuries will have peripheral nervous system injuries. And we're talking uh, amongst the different studies somewhere between 10% and a third. And if you look at just that group that had peripheral nervous system injuries, uh, uh, about 60% have a traumatic brain injury. So these are people who have multiple trauma, multiple complex injuries that are presenting. Most are uh, young men uh, who do foolish things, but of course, older men like myself do foolish things also. So it's not restricted to them. Uh, which nerves are most affected? It's generally the upper limbs are more affected than the lower limbs. And the big nerves in the upper limbs that are affected are the radial nerve because it's sitting right in that humeral spiral groove, the ulnar nerve is it's going across the elbow, the median nerve, particularly distally at the wrist, and then the lower limbs, the big ones of the sciatic nerve, particularly it's going by the acetabula, the acetabular fractures are commonly associated with sciatic neuropathies, and the fibular nerve, which used to be called perineal nerve, but we don't use that P word anymore because it's been uh, moved forward by the anatomist to fibular nerve. Major causes, these depend a little bit on location. So uh, in places like uh, Toronto, motor vehicle crashes, motorcycle crashes, uh, motorcycles are probably more highly represented than the numbers of motorcycles there are, as you, I'm sure you all know. Pedestrian injuries, gunshot wounds and stabs, uh, falls, uh, industrial injuries, uh, snowmobiles. Again, you probably have to be in Canada to get a substantial number of snowmobile injuries and bicycle injuries, unfortunately. Uh, if you're in Dallas, I think gunshot wounds would probably be a little bit higher on the list, but in Toronto, they would be a little bit lower on the list. So it depends on, on location. Now, when we think about peripheral nervous system injuries, peripheral nerve injuries, one thing to just be reminded of is what is the structure of the peripheral nerve? And just to remind you, the outside of the nerve, like if you're doing surgery or doing your anatomy dissections, you would see the outside of the nerve, which is the epineurium the epineurium, that's the outside covering. And then within that epineurium are multiple fascicles. Each fascicle is surrounded by its own covering called the perineurium. And then within that is the endoneurium, the axons and the myelin sheets. And so the, uh, the nerve injury is classified according to how much of this structure is, is uh, injured at the time of injury. And uh, there are a couple of classification systems. The most common one is by Seddon from around World War II. There's also, a, uh, who was a neurosurgeon uh, around that time. Another one by Sunderland, who was uh, an Australian uh, neuroanatomist, uh, came up with a slightly different system. But this is the one that we more commonly use. There are three, uh, three uh, types of injuries. Neuropraxia is the most mild. We'll go into more detail in each of these. Axonapesis is more severe where you've lost axons. And neuropnesis is basically where the nerve has been cut into two or pulled apart into two pieces with a gap in between them. And where you are along the spectrum largely dictates the prognosis as well as the treatment, treatment options. And the procedures that, that uh, me and my colleagues do, electromyography, can help tell which category we're in and also help to tell the prognosis of natural recovery. So neuropraxia is your most uh, mild uh, injury. It's comparatively mild compared to the other two. You will see clinically motor and sensory loss. You'll see weakness, you'll see sensory loss, but you won't uh, cut through. Uh, this injury doesn't uh, involve uh, discontinuity of axons. You haven't cut through the axons. The axons are still continuous within the nerve, even though the myelin might be injured, the axons are still continuous. So they do not degenerate they still stay alive distally in the limb and uh, that creates a much better prognosis. Uh, when we study the nerve on electrical studies and we look at just the distal segment, distal to the injury, the nerve looks pretty normal. Uh, the myelin is still there distally, the axons are still there and everything seems to function fine. And we think that neuropraxia is most commonly associated with focal demyelination. You've distorted or disrupted the myelin and that temporarily causes a block of conduction. In these cases, recovery can be pretty quick within a few hours or it could take up to three months. Generally three months is the upper limit of uh, where we think about for recovery. I need to take a little bit of a detour to talk about nerve conduction studies. So when I talk, use the terminology, you'll have a sense of what we're talking about. This is a median motor uh, uh, nerve conduction study. We're recording from the abductopolysis brevis. We're stimulating at the wrist and at the elbow. 
And the x-axis is time. Each little dot here is five milliseconds or five thousandths of a second. And each vertical dot is five millivolts or five uh, thousandths of a volt. And so, excuse me, I'm going to close the window it's right above the button you want. Um, uh, each vertical dot is five millivolts. So we can get a measure of time, how quickly the nerve conducts by looking at how long it takes between stimulation, which is the start of each sweep, and the response. And we can look at how many muscle fibers are innervated by looking at the size of the response. If you lost half the muscle fiber innervation, this would be about half the size. So we can use this to start to uh, delineate what kind of nerve injury we might have. Uh, so just to to mention that the speed, that how fast things are conducting, primarily influenced by cold, the colder you are, the slower you conduct, it's about 5% per degree centigrade, and age, the older you get, none of the, not that any of us would be elderly, uh, but the older you get, the slower it goes. And then demyelination is the big pathologic factor. If you lose or distort myelin, it would go slower. The size of that response from top to bottom that's primarily influenced by the number of innervated muscle fibers. So uh, if you've lost motor axons uh, and those cell bodies in, are the anterior one cells in the spinal cord, if you've lost those guys, you'll drop your motor amplitude. If your neuromuscular junction, the connection between the axon and the muscle fibers is not working well, you would have a smaller response. Or if you lose muscle fibers, they become abnormal. You would again get a smaller response. So that's what influences the size and the speed of conduction. If you had, uh, just going back to neuropraxia now, that more mild injury where you lose myelin. So here's a model of the nerve, the injury site, we're recording from the distal muscle here. If you have demyelination here and you come in to do nerve conductions on day one, if you stimulate proximal to the injury recorded from the muscle, you get no response because the demyelination blocks conduction. The nerve can't conduct across that demyelinated segment. But if you stimulate distal to the injury site, those axons think everything's fine. They don't know that there's been demyelination up here. You can stimulate them and they record uh, from the muscle, it's totally fine. And even if you came back on day 10, you would still see the conduction block where there's nothing above, but you'd get a nice response below. But the axons are still fine. They have not degenerated and you'll still get a nice healthy response below. So we just see what we call conduction block neuropraxia, and you would not lose that distal motor response because the axons have not degenerated. Now, the next more severe injury is axonothesis, and this is commonly seen in crush injuries. This is where the axons and the myelin sheets are now broken. You have discontinuity of the axons, but the surrounding stroma, like the uh, epineurium, the perineurium, is at least partially intact, so the nerve is still continuous if you looked at it grossly. And when you lose the axons, when you lose that continuity, they degenerate from that point distally down to the muscle. So those axons die off distally and uh, they would need to regrow. And that re recovery will depend upon the ability of the axons to regrow down the nerve, how disorganized is the nerve. So if you have a lot of scarring and internal disorganization, they may not be able to get there or it may take them a long time. And then key to this is the distance to the muscle. Those axons need to grow, and they go about a millimeter a day. Uh, they need to grow down to muscle, to reach muscle. Uh, and that's, this is a key thing that we're going to come back to again. Distance is, uh, time and distance and function are all interrelated. The most severe one is neuropnesis. This is where the nerve is completely severed or so scarred that regrowth does not occur. Uh, so, you know, a sharp laceration, uh, is an example, traction where you have a rupture of the nerve, drug injection, the old penicillin into the sciatic nerve, those causes so much scarring, you're not going to get recovery. Here, the prognosis is extremely poor without, uh, without surgery. And this is an example of what we might see on nerve conductions in either axonotmesis or neurotmesis. They look very similar because the only difference is the integrity of the supporting structures. Axonotmesis, you lose axons, Neuroapnesis, you lose axons plus the epineurium and perineurium, but they don't conduct the epineurium and perineurium. So if you came on day one, you'd stimulate proximal, you'd get no response. But distally, if you stimulate, at day one, the axons don't know that anything's wrong. They still think everything's fine in the world. They don't know that there's been a cut to the axons up there. 
they, uh, they don't know that they're gonna suffer a terrible death in the next few days. But if you come back on day 10, stimulate above and then stimulate below, you'll get no response because these axons have degenerated. And that tells us we have a situation of axonomesis or neurobesis. So this is how nerve conductions can help us separate the, uh, the uh, severity or the type of nerve injury. The size of this distal motor response is roughly proportional how many axons we have. So in this case, by 10, 10, we have nothing. So we lost all the axons. If this was half the original or half the normal value, we'd say we've probably lost about half of the axons. So it's a way to quantify roughly how many axons are left after a nerve uh, injury. The other thing we do is we do needle EMG. We put a needle into the muscle. This is a different portion of the testing. And by doing this, we can pick up denervation, reinnervation. But I just want to go over a few basics so you uh, understand where this is coming from. And the, the starting point for this discussion about needle and EMG is the motor unit. The motor unit is the anterior horn cell, the cell body, the axon, and how many muscle fibers, and the muscle fibers that are supplied by that single axon. And this number varies significantly. So you might have six muscle fibers in the laryngeal muscles where you want really fine control, but you don't need a lot of force but you might have a thousand muscle fibers in the quadriceps where you don't really care about fine uh, control as much, but you really want a lot of force. And so when we put a needle in the muscle, we record from a volume of muscle and at rest, it should be pretty quiet. And when the person contracts, we get what's called a motor unit action potential, motor unit action potential. That's the single motor unit activating and creating an electrical discharge. So that's the normal situation. If you have denervation, if you've lost that axon, then these muscle fibers develop acetylcholine hypersensitivity and they start firing on their own. Single muscle fiber discharges firing on their own, not under voluntary control. And we record these as fibrillations or also known as positive sharp waves, depending on how close you are to the muscle fiber. These reflect uh, denervation. This happens a few weeks after denervation, you'll see these fibrillations, the sharp waves. Uh, and these uh, are, uh, are the indicator that you've lost axons. The other thing that happens after a lesion is that you can get some re -innervation. And there's two ways that can happen. The first one is if you have an incomplete injury, maybe one axon is dead, but the guy next to him is okay. Then the one that's surviving, it somehow knows that this denervated muscle fibers nearby. So it sends out these sprouts, re these denervated muscle fibers, and uh, it can actually increase its territory by about fivefold. You can get re about five times its original territory. Uh, now, these new sprouts are not well myelinated, but the motor unit potential that we see is larger amplitude, longer duration from start to finish, and it's polyphase. These, there are many phases here, which reflects this poor, uh, deep, poor uh, myelination of these new sprouts. It tells us that this is a new sprout that is not yet synchronized with the remaining motor unit. Because you can increase uh, your motor unit territory by about fivefold, that means in a chronic uh, situation, you can lose up to 80% of your motor axons and still have pretty good strength because those remaining axons can re over time and resupply those muscle fibers, which is kind of good. Now, what if you don't have an incomplete injury? What if you lose the whole nerve, all the axons, then you don't have that option we just talked about. So then you're saying, okay, I wonder if the axons can regrow down the old axon tubes. They go about a millimeter a day and they will then start to reach some of these muscle fibers that have been sitting out here denervated. These will be very small, uh, very polyphasic and variable motor units because they just start to reinnervate their own muscle fiber, their new muscle fibers. They're what we call nascent motor unit potential. So we can see that that's happening. And if that happens, that's actually quite a good sign because it means the axons are regrowing uh, back down. So when we think about uh, prognosis, and that's one of the things that uh, I've been interested in over the years is can we estimate prognosis for these nerve injuries? Uh, what are the factors? Well, the degree of traumatic nerve injury, neuropraxia, good prognosis, we see that axonotmesis uh, uh, worse, and neuropnesis, you really need to see a nerve surgeon. The distance is a critical thing because uh, the muscle degenerates over time. And we want to think about that regrowth. It's a millimeter a day in Canada. I have to say, 
It's a little faster in Canada than in the US because in the US we use an inch a month. And if an inch a month, uh, if I have this correct on, it's about 25 millimeters. So I think we're a little bit better off in uh, Canada in terms of our regrowth rate, although it's easier to calculate in the US. An inch is easier to uh, think about than a millimeter. But what happens is the muscle fibers fibrose and degenerate, and they are no longer open to re after 18 to 24 months. The nerve could get there at uh, two years out, but it's no use. It's no use at all because the muscle has fibrosed. And so time, this is where time becomes function. We got to, if we're going to get axons to muscle, we got to do it by this 18 months is preferable. Earlier is better, but this is sort of the outer limit of where we want to get to. The other things that we can uh, use EMG for to uh, help us in this prognosis is to measure the extent of axon loss, the extent of demyelination, and the evidence of reinnervation. If there's reinnervation, that tells us things are working uh, better uh, spontaneously. And the general rule of thumb is that if you have spontaneous reinnervation, it's going to be better than a surgical intervention. So if you see natural reinnervation, that's going to be better, and you may want to hold off on surgery. So uh, what we've uh, published around a variety of different nerves is that these are some useful, these are the three most useful prognostic factors. We look at the first muscle coming after the uh, injury site. If you have good voluntary recruitment, that's a good prognosis. That tells us nerve is starting to grow down. It hit that first muscle after the injury site, and it's quite possible, in fact, quite likely, that it's going to continue down the nerve. If we got nothing going in, going on in that first muscle after the injury site, that's a relatively poor prognosis. We also look at the size of that distal motor response I showed you earlier. If we have a big distal response, that tells us we have a lot of uh, axons still there, and it's more likely to recover, recover as the nerve uh, reinnervates. Sorry, as the nerve remyelinates. Uh, the more axons you have at the time of injury, the better your prognosis. But if you've got no motor response, that tells us, you know what, you've, you've uh, affected all the axons and regrowth is our only option. And that's going to be a, a more prolonged recovery. And then it's sort of paradoxical, but if you have conduction block or slowing, these are both signs of demyelination. If you have slowing or conduction block, which are abnormal, that's actually a good sign. And that's a good sign because that tells you tells us we have demyelination. And demyelination through the Schwann cell regrowth can recover better than loss of axons. If you don't have demyelination in a nerve injury, that's a relatively worse sign. So those are the general things that we go by. This does vary a lot between nerves, though. There are anatomical uh, variables. Shorter nerves have an easier time than longer nerves. Uh, fascicular architecture varies. So the tibial nerve, which has a lot of small fascicles, is more resistant to injury and recovers better than the fibular nerve, which just has a few large fascicles. Uh, also, sometimes aberrant regeneration is a problem. So think about facial nerve. If you have a facial nerve injury, the axons destined to go to the orbicularis oculi in the eye may make it down to the mouth. And so when you intend to blink, your mouth closes and vice versa. Uh, that's predominantly facial nerve and laryngeal nerves is where that's an issue, not so much in the limb. And then your functional requirements differ. So some uh, muscles require uh, fine, precise control like ulnar, laryngeal. Some require power like your femoral nerve and the quadriceps. And then which segment is more important? To get good function off the ulnar nerve, that distal hand re innervation is much more critical Whereas for your fibular nerve, if you have a fibular neuropathy at the, at the knee, you mainly need your dorsiflexes, which are the first muscles coming off. You don't really care so much about re the uh, intrinsic foot muscles. So there's quite a bit of variability there. And so you have to end up looking at each nerve, uh, each nerve according to uh, uh, specific for that nerve, I should say. So this is a study that we published on the ulnar nerve where we used a recursive partitioning kind of approach. And if we see demyelination, which is conduction block to the first dorsal inner osseus, generally, if you see that, that's a good sign. And it's an abnormality, I know, but that tells you you have uh, demyelination. And two thirds of those folks recovery, recover. Whereas if you have no demyelination, that's a relatively poor sign. And then the second level is to look at the size of that distal motor response. If you have 
demyelination and a big distal motor response, uh, almost everyone recovers well. Whereas if you have on the other end of the spectrum, no slowing, but you've got a tiny motor response, you've lost a lot of axons, only about 7% recover. And so we can start to use this approach to understand the natural history and to start to think about who might be the best surgical candidates. Uh, similar for the radial nerve, although it's uh, somewhat uh, specific to the radial nerve, the biggest factor here on radial nerve, and we see these a lot after humeral fractures, is if you have good recruitment in the brachioradialis muscle, that first muscle after the injury site, if you have good recruitment there, and it doesn't matter if your finger and wrist extensors are good, but if you have good recruitment here, 92% do well. If you have on the other end of the spectrum, poor recruitment or no recruitment and no distal motor response from extensor indices, only a third do well. Uh, this is a relatively poor prognostic sign. Uh, and so we can start to again, separate out who might have a relatively good prognosis from who would have a poor prognosis uh, soon after a nerve uh, injury. Uh, same thing for fibular nerve. This is, uh, and here the, the biggest thing was the size of the compound muscle action potential or that motor amplitude I showed you earlier. Uh, this is recorded from the tibialis anterior muscle, which is a much more functionally important muscle. Uh, if you have a big CMAP, 90% uh, recover. As your CMAP gets small, as your motor response gets small, uh, about 70%. And if you have no motor response at all, uh, there you're dependent upon axons regrowing. Uh, it's about 45% do well. We can do the same thing recorded from a distal foot muscle, the extensor to torn brevis, although this one doesn't really have as much functional significance, so we don't really look at that as much. So th these are some of the prognostic factors that we use. And conceptually, I just want to take a, a diversion for a moment to talk about the conceptual uh, recovery. Uh, so we think about strength on the y-axis here in time on the x-axis, and we start off with pretty normal strength. And then with the injury, we drop our strength. And as time goes on, we might get recovery through resolution of the conduction block. Here we're talking about uh, the remyelination that can occur. And this is generally done by about three months. And then later on, we might get some of that distal axon sprouting I showed you for incomplete injuries, where the existing muscle fibers will spread out and supply the denervated muscle fibers. And then as you use your uh, muscles more, you might get some muscle fiber hypertrophy, uh, like uh, Don's legs have probably a huge time muscle fiber hypertrophy because of the cycling. And then ultimately you might get some, once the axons grow back down again, you might get some axonal uh, regeneration, but things are gonna be pretty stable by 18 months. You're not gonna get much happening after, after that. And so I wanna move next into the uh, surgical realm and what are some, really cool surgical things that are now available that didn't used to be uh, when, uh, when I was first in training. Uh, just a reminder that uh, uh, time is muscle, time is function. So if you have a uh, brachial plexus injury and you're counting on re the hand muscles and you go a millimeter a day or an inch a month, do the, if you do the numbers, you're just not gonna get down to the hand in time. It's just because you're going to have irreversible atrophy. Because uh, if you, even if you do surgery up here, you're going to allow all that time for the axons to grow back down again. It's just not going to happen. And so we, uh, the brachial plexus repairs are not always, you don't always go operate on the brachial plexus because it's just not enough time for axons to grow back down again. And we think about it as normal muscle. Then you have a window opportunity for surgery Generally, we're looking within that first six months to do the surgery because atrophy is going to be kicking in at 12 months. And then once you're at a, out past a year, surgery is really not an option because if you calculate how long does it take for the muscle to atrophy, plus how long is it going to take for the axons to grow back down again, you're just not going to make it in time. So we do, uh, now we do are doing nerve transfers. We're taking an expendable functioning donor nerve and plugging it into a non-functioning recipient. And we can do that closer to the muscle, and that brings that regeneration front closer to where the action is. So you don't have to, uh, uh, you don't have as far to regenerate. Less distance means less time means you can get there before the muscle uh, atrophies. So it turns out that we have more muscles than we need. We have more muscles than we need. We have many redundant muscles. So 
you got three heads of triceps, you don't really need all three to, to do elbow extension. You got two wrist flexors, flexor carpi radialis and ulnaris. You don't need both of those to do wrist flexion. You got three elbow flexors, biceps, brachialis, and brachioradialis. You got two forearm pronators, pronated teres and pronated quadratus. Two sets of finger flexors, flexor digitorum, superficialis, and profundus. And there are many other examples. So what that means is we can steal one of these and plug it into a non-functioning muscle to try to get back some uh, recovery. And there's a couple of ways to do this. The most uh, sure way to do this is what's called end-to-end. -end. So you have your recipient nerve that's uh, essentially not functional. You have your donor nerve that was supplying one of these redundant muscles and you make a couple of cuts and sew them together and let those axons regrow down, uh, down the recipient. Uh, uh, neural tubes. Now, once you make the cut here, these axons all die. So the process of recovery is these donor axons growing back down into the muscle and uh, uh, resupplying the muscle. And that's where it has to go at that millimeter a day or inch a month. There are other variants where you can do end to side or it's called supercharge end to side. You can, uh, if, you, if it's not a complete injury, you can say, well, I'm gonna take this donor, this extra donor, plug it into the side of this nerve and let some axon, extra axons pour in here and resupply those distal muscles. And then you're not cutting this nerve in case there's some uh, incipient function that's still working. So these nerve transfers are really kind of exciting. And the, the uh, field has gone from one of nerve repair, uh, which has had variable results to one of nerve transfers that I just showed you. And there are some really good examples that we do commonly, uh, as, as common as these things are, uh, at Sunnybrook that really work quite well. So if you have a radial nerve injury and the prognosis is poor, we can take the median nerve that supplies the finger flexors and, and plug that into the wrist extensors. And this is actually synergistic. So think about when you open and close your hand, you open it this way and you close it, wrist extension and finger flexion goes together. It's just a natural tenodesis. So if you take those finger flexors and plug them into the wrist extensors, it comes pretty naturally. Same thing on the other side. So you can take your wrist flexors and plug it into the finger extensors, extensor digitorum communis. So as you go to pick something up, you both flex your wrist and extend your fingers at the same time. And by doing that nerve transfer, it becomes fairly automatic and synergistic. Uh, the third uh, common one, which we have for, say, an upper trunk or musculocutaneous nerve injury, is to give someone back uh, uh, elbow flexion. And here it's not necessarily as synergistic, but we can take the ulnar nerve that supplies, uh, we just take some fascicles, we don't take everything, supplies flexor carpi ulnaris, plug that into biceps, and take the FCR uh, fascicles, plug that into brachialis. This is called the double fascicular transfer or Oberlin procedure. And by doing that, we can, we'll still preserve some wrist flexion because we don't take all the fascicles, but then we give back a biceps and brachialis function. So we get some elbow flexion. There are many other examples as well. And at the end, I'll show you some articles. The other one that's just, we're just bringing on board now, we've got uh, probably a year or two of experience and this is uh, not just us, but it's done elder places uh, uh, in the US and Canada is we're saying, you know what, if this works for peripheral nerves, maybe we can also do it with the spinal cord. So we can take a functioning muscle from above the spinal cord injury level of lesion and plug it into something below and give people new function that they didn't have before. This is not a complete repair of the nerve injury, but it gives people some new level of function. So an example is someone who doesn't have wrist extension. This would be someone that would say a C5 injury C5 level injury. You can take the supinator, which is generally above the level of injury, not a functionally, sorry, not a, fun, not a functionally important muscle and plug that into ECRL to give them some wrist extension. Uh, and this is, uh, you don't miss the supinator because you still got biceps, which is a stronger supinator and you start to get wrist extension. Similarly, elbow extension is really important for these guys. So if you've got someone with say a C5 or C6 injury, who has no triceps, you can take a branch to deltoid, you've got three heads of deltoid, you can sacrifice one of those like the posterior deltoid, plug that into the triceps and give them some uh, elbow extension. 
Same thing for digit flexion. This one doesn't work as well as the other ones I showed you, which is uh, uh, you take a branch to brachialis, one of your redundant elbow flexors, and plug that into the anterior interosseous nerve, which supplies flexor digitorum profundus, give you some finger flexion, and flexor palsis as long as give you some thumb flexion. Uh, uh, and then you can also, uh, depending on what you need and the level of injury, if you don't need wrist extension, you can use the supinative to plug into extensor digitorum and be in the posterior neurosis nerve can give you some uh, finger extension. So these, uh, they're not like, it's not a complete cure of the spinal cord injury by any means, but they have a meaningful impact. We had, uh, I remember we saw a patient a few months ago who said she just had elbow flexion, that's all she could do. And then after these sur uh, surgeries, she said, you know, I can pick up a potato chip and eat it now. Now, potato chips aren't good for you, and it's not really, so, you know, our goal, but that was a big deal for her, that she could pick up her own food with her hand and bring it up to her mouth to eat. So they do offer quite a bit of uh, promise. Uh, one thing is that we have to predict how good is the, uh, uh, sorry, I think I might have gone past. No, we're good. Um, uh, how good is the, uh, uh, the recipient and the donor? Uh, and the recipient, we want to know, are we in the case where we're losing uh, motor uh, axons? If we're losing Mac motor axons at the zone of injury, and I might just skip ahead. No, I think I, sorry for the confusion. Okay, let me come back here. So uh, think about the uh, axon, sorry, the, the spinal cord injury as normal. This part is lower motor neuron where you've lost some of the uh, uh, anterior one cells. And then below that is an upper motor neuron injury. If you have an upper motor neuron injury, there's plenty of time to do these nerve transfers. But if you have a lower motor neuron injury in the zone of injury, you don't have time. You're still dealing with that one year. Uh, you're still gonna start to get uh, irreversible atrophy. So if you're dealing with a muscle that's supplied in the zone of injury, uh, there's a bit of a rush to get the nerve transfers done. And generally we wanna do these by six months. So uh, that's where we start to do these motor responses. And this is a recent publication that we had where we're saying, okay, we have to see is the triceps in the zone of the lower motor neuron injury, in which case we wanna have an early discussion with the patient about doing one of these nerve transfers like deltoid to triceps, or are we in the upper motor neuron uh, stage where you know what, there's no rush. You can think about it and see how much natural recovery you get. So we are now developing new techniques to record from muscles we wouldn't typically record from because these become more important than they did before. So triceps or extensor carpi radialis longus. We wanna know are these um, uh, muscles in the zone of injury where there's a bit of a rush to get a nerve uh, transfer done or do we have time to take our time and uh, 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 do the surgery later? Uh, and this requires not only recording sites, but also uh, we have to find, well, where do we stimulate the nerve? And we have to do some uh, ultrasound and uh, just review our anatomy to see, well, where is the radial nerve in the axilla and how do we stimulate it? But we have figured that out. And the last thing I'll, I'll just mention briefly is that uh, uh, we use uh, EMG to monitor recovery after repair of a nerve injury or after repair uh, after a nerve transfer and spinal cord injury. Uh, so uh, uh, early on after uh, the nerve injury or after denervation, we'll see the fibrillations like I showed you. We won't see any voluntary motor units. As time goes on, fibrillations will die off. And if we're going to see recovery, we'll see unstable uh, nascent motor units, like motor units where the axons just got to the muscle and they start to re muscle fibers. And uh, then eventually, once you get good re you'll see no fibrillations and you'll see large stable motor units that suggest that there's been a stable uh, re -innervation. And we can work our way down the, this, in this case, it's the radial nerve. We can say, okay, the uh, brachioradialis is well innervated. ECR is just starting. These distal muscles, nothing there yet. And we can look at this every couple of months to see if the nerve is actually growing down, uh, if the axons are actually growing down the nerve as we would expect. So I will stop there. Uh, if you uh, fell asleep or were on Facebook or on Twitter or otherwise preoccupied today doing your email, these are three articles that you could look at to uh, review more. Uh, of course, I'm just one part of a team. Uh, 
Uh, I owe a huge uh, debt of gratitude to my colleagues in plastic surgery, Jana Dangler, Paul Binhammer, Heather Baltzer, uh, and then uh, my colleague in crime, Peter Broadhurst, who does the EMGs with me. We have just a terrific uh, multidisciplinary combined clinic where we get together uh, uh, twice a month. We see these patients all together, uh, the plastic surgeons and the uh, electromographers. We do the studies together and we do a lot of discussion around surgical planning. So I will stop there, if that's okay. Uh, Donna, I will look to your direction about uh, stopping screen share and glad to take any questions that you might have. That was great, uh, uh, Larry. And we'll ask people in the audience to signal their question through the uh, uh, group chat function. And while people are, are mentioning that, but let me start with the first and obvious question. It's, uh, 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 namely, um, you know, any special tactics I can use to help my patients uh, preserve their muscles and nerves, and in particular, not the shoulders, the um, uh, the larynx. So many of my patients have so much aspiration risk when they get older. Yeah, that's a that's a great question. So I I, I do uh, I just from a couple of perspectives. So we do see laryngeal nerve injuries uh, not too infrequently. They can be uh, certainly from prolonged intubation. They can be from uh, neuralgic amyotrophy. They can be from uh, thyroidectomy, uh, a variety of causes. Uh, and uh, uh, actually, Jun Lin is an otolaryngologist who we do them together with. And she, uh, we, we do these EMGs together. I don't like sticking needles in the neck particularly that much. And so uh, if it looks like it's going to be a prolonged recovery, she can do an injection uh, to try to fill up the spinal, the uh, sorry, the vocal cord, uh, and make it more beefy and give people a, a little bit better voice. Uh, in general, the general question of preserving muscle until the nerves get back uh, to the muscle is a good one. And so far, I don't think there's anything. I mean, I wish there was. People have tried all kinds of different uh, electrical stimulation protocols, uh, but I don't think it's uh, helpful at all. And you know, my review of the literature and my own use, I don't think it's particularly helpful. Man, well, that is tragic because that sort of is absolutely lethal. I don't see any other questions yet, so I'll ask the next one. And in particular, any progress about nerve transfers for the face? I'm thinking like Jean Chrétien. It must have been a career limiting issue for him. Yeah, no, it's a it's a very interesting and evolving field. So our, our colleague Heather Balzer was at the West. She comes over here once a month, and she does these facial reanimation surgeries, and they're pretty interesting. Uh, you want to do them, again, because of the concern about muscle fibrosis, generally within the first six months, if you can. But you, there's a couple of strategies. So one is, uh, because the muscles of mastication, like your masseter temporalis, they're supplied by the fifth cranial nerve, uh, they are uh, candidates for transfer, and you don't need all of them. So she will take a branch from the masseter and plug that into zygomaticus and other muscles that are involved with smiling. And so what the patient learns to do is to bite down and smile at the same time. And it gives them not a perfect, but a pretty good result. And then the, uh, and that's been very reliable. Uh, the other one that uh, is uh, uh, done perhaps less commonly is the cross nerve facial transfers. So she will take a branch from the ubicularis oculi on one side, she'll take a piece of sural nerve, drive it under the skin, to the other side and plug it in on the other side. So when the person blinks theoretically, they'll blink on both sides or they'll raise their eyebrows on both sides. That uh, is not quite as predictable as the masseter one, uh, but that's another option that she looks at. And of course there's gold weights you can put in the eyelids to try to give you a little bit better eye closure as well. Uh, but generally, you know, like with all these nerve injuries, uh, if you can get, uh, I'd rather over refer than under refer. So if you can, if people can get them to us in the first six months, uh, that's probably better. We we never mind uh, extra referrals. I, we'd rather see it early. That's great. Um, still, still, still coming for for questions. So I'll ask you another one. And I was sure. very impressed by. Oh no, Sander Hitzig, Thank you for rescuing me. <laughs> Sander, go ahead and unmute. Uh, so. Um, yeah, no, interesting talk, Larry. Uh, always great to hear about your work. Um, you know, again, not having the background, there's certain things that uh, 
fla I flash back to my high school biology uh, and have uh, relived those uh, moments where I'm, I'm trying to follow. But um, one of the things, you know, working with you a little bit and, and Yana Dengler was around the uptake of the surgery. I, I don't know if it was particularly this up surgery, but generally, you know, it, it has such promising results. Uh, how do you find the uptake, you know, in particular with the SCI community? Because I know sometimes uh, surgeons and, and, and people like yourself doing great work in this space, it doesn't always necessarily translate. So I'm just wondering, uh, you know, how receptive is the community or how aware? And then uh, what are some things that you guys are doing to help, you know, say, hi, I'm Larry Robinson, I'm doing amazing work, come uh, re get referred to me. You know, that's a great question that is, you've identified one of the big barriers in doing this spinal cord injury because you want to do this surgery early on within six months. And so that means you want to meet the patient and develop that relationship within three to four months. And the barriers to doing that is that someone has a huge life changing event and they're wondering, you know, I might get um, uh, some natural recovery over time. And do I really want to do a surgery? if I'm gonna see some spontaneous recovery. Now, most of that recovery does occur by six months, but it's not 100%. So just talking about natural recovery and when that's gonna occur, and do you really want, you know, do, do I really wanna do this irreversible surgery? Uh, but you lose that time window if you don't do it early on. Uh, the other th uh, thing is that there's a lot of competing things that are coming at these patients. Well, what about stem cells? What about other new research that could be useful. What about electrical stimulation? And they put those all in the same bucket when they're thinking about it. Uh, you know, it's just like you go on Twitter and you see a hundred different tweets, they all look about the same credibility as the other ones. So they think that's, that's the perception of the patient. The way we are uh, sort of trying to maneuver those barriers is by developing a really close relationship with our colleagues at Lindhurst. So it's not us saying, hey, we got this new treatment. It's rather the uh, MRP or the physiatrist saying, hey, you know, this is something we want you to explore and, and refer you to. It's just a discussion initially. Then they see us, they need us. We don't talk about necessarily doing surgery on that first visit. We say, let's just take a look today. We'll take a look at it again in another month or two uh, and develop that relationship. Um, but coming from the patient's own doctors, I think that's more powerful than us going on and saying, this is a treatment you really ought to have. Uh, it's it's a very significant barrier, though, for sure. That's a great response. All right, uh, uh, Kave, I think you've got the next question. Uh, just a hey, Larry, thanks for the talk. I was just, I mean, I, I don't. This has very little to do with my own clinical work, but I still find it cool. So I was just kind of nice. I mean, these patients are often hard, very difficult to help, I'm sure. But what? So what? What has been the most gratifying advance? over your career or maybe coming around the corner that you foresee? Yeah, no, it's a great, great point. So, uh, you know, for me, over many years, we, we, we could diagnose, we could prognosticate these nerve injuries pretty well, but treatments were limited, you yeah, know, because they would, well, yeah. yeah, I mean, you do the nerve repair, you would do the grafting, but if you're up in the brachial plexus, you knew the chances of success were really quite low. And so uh, th this has really been a game changer for these severe, the plexus, the proximal nerve injuries. It's been a, a real game changer where there are new options that we didn't have before. Probably the most gratifying to me personally, in addition to that, is just getting to work with the surgical colleagues in a combined clinic. I, that is the most fun clinic I have every month is just working with the per peripheral nerve surgeons. So, you know, uh, they, we don't let them use reflex hammers and they don't let us do the Tinel sign because they're the experts at that. But, uh, and then they have those two point discriminators that we don't get to touch. But, you know, we just learn from each other all the time, how we think about the nerve injuries, how we examine patients. Uh, the trainees find it a really valuable, probably a little intimidating with a bunch of uh, staff watching them, but find it a really valuable learning experience. That has been really a ton of fun, just working together in a collaborative clinic where we bring different disciplines, different viewpoints. We just, like even just the history and physical, we do differently. We learn from each other. I mean, maybe this is totally off base, but one of the cool things about it, it's kind of old fashioned the way the advance has happened in the sense that it's like basic anatomy. Like, it's not like there's been a new monoclonal antibody that's helped you transplant nerves. It's like figuring out based on the anatomic and physiologic understanding, which would be the best nerve to transfer and stuff like that or the best target. That's kind of cool, actually. 
Yeah, yeah, yeah. And it was actually developed. I don't know if any of you remember Susan McKinnon. She used to be at Sunnybrook some years ago, and then she's, she moved to Washington University in St. Louis. But she's the real developer of this, the, the oh. pioneer in this field. And then uh, uh, that's gotten uptake uh, mostly in uh, North America, US, uh, Canada. Uh, uh, Canada, we probably have more of these combined clinics. And some of this has to do probably with the financial incentives around patient care. But we're fine with just seeing patients together. And uh, it's been really cool. Yeah. And you're right, it's just a simple rerouting. It's not complex monoclonal antibodies. It's a simple rerouting. And you can be somewhat creative and start wondering, well, I wonder if you can plug the femoral nerve into the tibial. There's not that much to lose. You got a redundant muscle. And yeah, it is very neat. cool. Yeah. So one just and just in practice, are they mostly plastic surgeons? Or is there an equal number of neurosurgeons in there too? It's very much site dependent. So for in our setting, it's uh, mostly plastic surgeon, but for our Farhad Perusman also does some of these nerve transfers. Uh, we actually have a, a monthly interdisciplinary uh, imaging conference where uh, we have the musculoskeletal radiologists who show us the nerve images on ultrasound, on MRI, and MR neurography. And then we have Farhad there for neurosurgery, the plastic surgeons, myself and Peter Broadhurst, we're all looking at this nerve from different perspectives. And so often we'll present the, you know, someone will present the history, I'll present the EMG, uh, Thiru or Linda Proven will present the uh, imaging and then the surgeons say, oh, this is what it looked like when we did surgery. And it's a very cool way to learn across multiple disciplines. Thanks, Larry. Yeah, no, thank you for the questions. Larry, I'm seeing some compliments, but uh, but no other questions. So that I'll probably ask the last. Oh, Natalie, oh, has Natalie, has oh, a Natalie. Question. Right. Sorry, my boss. I <laughs> your boss. I just, I got uh, laid up with them um, interviews. They they were running late, so I'm sorry I came in late. I'm really fascinating talking. I you're. He's just said that working with the surgeons is the best part of his day. But <laughs> I, was, um, I was thinking of Lisa before you said that. I was thinking of Lisa De Prospera's um, team um, with PRBI and. Um, the allied health researchers and is there a mechanism to involve them more in this to get their, um, the patients referred in earlier or you know should this be should we be looking at this on a QI standpoint from uh, Sunnybrook to make sure that patients who should be referred do get referred and that we're not missing these opportunities and how could we collaborate more to do that? No, it's a great point. And uh, I didn't uh, mention in the team that Kelly Bishop, uh, one of our occupational therapists, key member of the team, uh, that hand therapy is so critically important to maintain range of motion, to do splinting, to just preserve the limb until the nerve repair kicks in, and then to teach people how to use the, the limb effectively after the nerve repair. So I think there is uh, definitely some opportunity around PBRI and getting some of the other health disciplines in, in the picture. Uh, the QI, it's a great point because I must say that before I got involved in the nerve surgeons, I didn't know what I was missing. In other words, I probably had uh, some patients who would have been good subjects for nerve transfers, but I didn't know this was an option. And uh, so now I'm sort of proselytizing to others, hey, this is a really important option. You want to get in there early. And there could be a good QI project. I agree with you, a good QI project to look at. Yeah, and I don't, I'm not a QI expert, so I don't know how you would do it, but to look at, are we getting all the patients we should be getting? Are we getting them at the right time? Uh, I think there's sometimes still out there the notion that, well, let's wait a year and see how they recover. And if they don't recover, we'll send them over for surgery, but that's just waiting too long. Uh, yeah, I'd love to talk more later about, you know, if you got someone interested in QI, that would be a really fun project. That's great. And on that like hopeful and constructive point, we will end. Thanks very much, everybody. We'll see you all back in about one week's time. Bye. Okay.